and defending, uh, especially now that uh, they were not able to uh, have or rather come together to um, to strategize or mobilize her with re like how they were doing uh, initially. So for, for the human rights defenders, the pandemic really uh, affected them, uh, the way they defend, of course, and promote, and challenges such as lack of access to the internet and devices, as well as the digital skills slowly, and uh, for some completely halted the intervention. This forced them to find alternative ways to mobilize and defend uh, human rights. Um, so, what to Napan, how to Napana Net came on board is uh, after having a discussion and just knowing what they're doing, their values, and uh, uh, some of the challenges that they are facing at this time, we uh, curated a training program uh, just to um, have basics, like uh, get them introduced to the online space. So how can they mobilize in the online space? And beside that was also just to go and see uh, the different uh, organizations, and if we were to connect them, what will that look like in terms of infrastructure? How, will, how can we get, give them access? And uh, through this, we were able to connect five grassroots women rights defenders, and also uh, trade um, this, uh, this specific group, these five grassroots human rights defenders in Kibera, just to, um, on, on issues around um, uh, digital literacy, digital safety, online gender-based violence, how it manifests, uh, what are the, the types of online gender-based violence, uh, have conversation around the impact of online gender-based violence, as well like, as also train them on anti-censorship technologies even as they defend and promote um, our, our trainings uh, in nature was very peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, where we encourage them to really talk about their experiences um, while defending women in the on offline, and also see how uh, then they can relate uh, some of the intervention to then uh, translate in the online space. And um, also look at ways that they can be able to train their communities on, on, on online uh, violence, on digital literacy, so that by the end of, um, so that uh, it's, it's more of a training of trainers um, and that the, the information is spread to the community. So um, part of the, the training was on reimagining a safe and secure online space for women, where the women uh, could share on the kind of internet um, that they would like to see. And this is a, a process that not only we had with the grassroots human rights defenders that we trained, but also they had with the organizations that they work with in the community. So all these efforts, um, even as I'm winding um, up, is to ampli was to amplify the voices of these grassroots human rights defenders, even as they champion for online violence uh, effectively and safely, uh, while advocating against uh, against it. Also to enhance grassroots women working as human rights defenders um, to exploit the digital space as a platform to advocate for their work and increase reach and impact so that their impact is not just seen at the community level, but also that uh, it, it's, um, they can be able to mobilize efforts and um, uh, mobilize um, efforts and also uh, other, um, how do I put it, other yeah, efforts to just make sure that their work is uh, impactful. Uh, also, another thing that we work in on is advancing knowledge building so that um, the communities, um, the grassroots human rights defenders can be able to curate content that is very relevant to them, um, especially around um, the work that they're doing with the community. So here we uh, train them on uh, if they want to have conversations that they are uh, with, with the work that they're doing, um, how can they curate audios that can be listened within the community? How can they create a podcast? Uh, comic materials that can be easily relatable to young women and even um, other community members. So those are some of the, uh, the efforts that we have done as a community network in Nairobi to just make sure that um, um, 
online violence is curbed at, at, the very, at the grassroots level and it's championed by people who are already working on these issues um, at, at the community level. So next on, I'll welcome Catherine Muya to talk, on, uh, to talk of her experience with Article 19. Catherine, if you can, can you hear me. Hi, sorry. So I hope you can all hear me. And my name is Catherine Murray. I'm joining you from Nairobi. I work as a program officer for digital rights and policy at Article 19 Eastern Africa. Over the last, um, in my personal capacity, over the last year, I helped um, develop our research around uh, digital safety and security for organizations that work with structurally silenced women and with support of one of our partners. So when in this research, we we can we were looking at how organizations that work with marginalized women and also other categories of women, such as human rights defenders, um, uh, so human rights defenders, sex workers, LGBTIQ community, how they work and how they conduct their digital security work. And we were mostly looking at how these, while these organizations are designing trainings, what are some of the challenges that they encounter? What are also some of the organizations or how prepared are these organizations as they support at-risk communities? And we found or we made very interesting findings, including the fact that, um, of course, we highlighted some of the digital safety and security concerns that exist for these categories of women and the communities that they serve. And this included looking at what were the major risks um, the major digital security risks for LGBTIQ persons in Kenya, for human rights defenders. Some of those included surveillance, some of them, those included um, unauthorized interference with accounts. Um, majority of them, or majority of those things, also included online harassment. However, um, since our focus was really just to understand, and catfishing, catfishing was a really good, was a really severe thing. Um, our focus was really to understand how the organizations were working with them and how prepared they were. And what we found was a lot of work goes into training or providing digital security trainings for organizations. However, those digital security trainings are not um, they're not very well structured, they're very ad hoc, they're not continuously supported by donors. And so it becomes a one of occurrence where participants feel like they haven't spent a lot of time to understand the issues. There also is not really real cultural or um, organizational change. It might be or sustained organizational change in that sense, mostly because um, they feel that the training is offered only very limitedly. Um, sometimes a lot of the participants felt that the trainings are concentrated in urban areas, and so they don't reach grassroots organizations that work out of Nairobi or are work out of urban centers. And then a lot of um, the ways in which, so there was a lot of knowledge gaps amongst the people and also the organizations. The organizations themselves didn't also seem to have um, policies in place for digital security and um, continuous digital security trainings for their staff. A lot of the ones who, um, for the staff, uh, we interviewed or spoke to sex worker um, umbrella communities and how they support sex workers. And they also felt that a lot of this training is not if, is not given in a sustainable way, which would include like directly targeting maybe stakeholders of the sex worker organizations and then mainstreaming this sort of um, the sort of training into things in a trainer of trainer design as RISPA was alluding to, which is something that they do. Um, so really just creating a sustainable way in which to engage with um, digital security training. And some of the concepts that are given in digital security trainings are really complicated for some of the participants. And so it would help if, um, if the trainings are maybe let's say structured or they're more frequent, which is something that we, we we highlight a lot, um, which we, we got a lot in the sense that the trainings need to be more frequent, they need to be um, regular in order to foster that sustained cultural change. So most of our work really just relied on looking at how resilient our organizations, we also maintain that 
some of the organizations also said they don't have the capacity for it. Um, mostly they don't have in-house staff that directs them or helps them with their digital security work um, in addition to not having policies. So that makes it also very difficult in terms of knowing how to be very prepared in, in that sense, and especially because they deal with at risk communities. So in the end, overall, what the project recommended is that there needs to be some sort of sustained funding from donors in terms when it comes to digital security, really seeing it as a problem, really seeing it as something that needs structural change and a lot of effort to go into um, the design and the knowledge gap and the awareness to ensure that that structural change is actually realized. So that's how much we, we went with our, our project. Thank you, Rispa. Yes, uh, thank you, Catherine. I I absolutely agree. Um, for I uh, and just to um, add uh, for a community networks, uh, you'd realize that the scope is very limited to the community for impact to be felt, and even the community, it's not a homogeneous group. It's different groups that needs different interventions. So for us, for for myself, I've kept on talking about grassroots human rights defenders, but there's also the police uh, that needs to get this uh, this knowledge because if grassroots human rights defenders are just uh, defending uh, defending on uh, women who are experiencing online violence then who is um, uh, who how does the uh, police um, complement that work so it's definitely for us uh, recommendation is there's still more to be done at the community level and there's still more uh, there's also a uh, um, a need to really uh, have um, a structured sort of uh, content around um, online violence and uh, some of the strategies that the community can use and w something that is replicable so that other communities don't have to go through the same uh, process um, and uh, go through the same struggles, yet um, yet it's something that has been done. So um, with that, I'd like to open, in, open it up uh, to the room to if there's any question. I don't know if is there any question online? Um, perhaps, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if there was going to be a question, but I was going to ask you a question as, as we wait for the audience to ask us questions. So I was I was going to ask like, what are the how in how do you design your interventions in in your training? Sort of what are the learnings and successes that have worked for you that you think we could that you think are really important to mention even as we work with this different type of organization. Hmm. Yeah, so for us, um, number one is uh, the element of need assessment using the human rights research, human, uh, research de design, the design approach, just to engage the community even before uh, designing any, any sort of training for them, just to understand what are they doing, uh, what are their values, what are their strengths, and what are their challenges. And because for Community Network is basically on um, providing access, um, it's very important to have a holistic view so that even as you're bringing uh, online to the communities, um, they're able to understand also the harms that comes with uh, the online space and how they can protect themselves. So absolutely uh, having doing a need assessment with the community before engaging them especially on sensitive issues uh, of online violence. So seeing do um, what would make sense, would it be, um, would a training of everyone, both men and women giving solutions make sense for the community? Would a training of just women uh, make a sense for uh, that community? Or like very specific um, training, targeting different groups, even within the women uh, category? also is to uh, to also um, um, highlight the um, the 
the importance of uh, creating movements, movement building is also one of the key areas that we really strive to to have because once we've created, as just as you've said, Catherine, we don't want it to have, we don't want it to be a one-off uh, engagement. Uh, uh, like a training or just connecting them and that's it. We want to have constant engagement because as we know technology is something that keeps on evolving and even as it, as it evolves as with the trends, the community that we've connected, it's our responsibility to keep updating them on um, the, the positive things, the benefits they, that they can reap on the online space and also some of the dangers uh, that uh, keep coming up, uh, such as disinformation, having conversation around that. And how do we do that? It's through movement building. So creating um, creating like a cohort of, uh, of people, of the women we've trained uh, to uh, keep having uh, conversations regularly with them. And um, yeah, so that it's, it's safety uh, by design. Yeah, so I, I would, um, yeah, I would, re I would respond uh, with that, Catherine. Thank you, and I, I think it's really important. Um, I think one of the things I also wanted to just point out, even as we do our work, really, was some of the participants that we were speaking to also really. Um, in addition to having this digital security training, also we're really keen on knowing the legal framework around digital safety and security, mostly because they also find that wanted to really in depth, in depthly understand what are the remedies that are offered. And I think that that when it comes to the issue of online violence and online safety, um, the remedies to which uh, people are like victims or um, those affected can really use to or explore. To, to to get remedies or to get remedial action is not really often very key. And so I think that it's something that we need to consider going forward, like, and even in our design. So I'm not sure if we, I, I'm not physically there. I'm not sure if you have any questions from the floor. Yes, we have one question. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, it's not exactly a question. I think I, I, I would like to get a clarification. You mentioned at some point that you do some link with now the the way the um, uh, the one your trainings are like tackling uh, offline gender-based violence. Yes. So I would like to know more about how you make the link between the offline and the online. Thank you. Yes, um, to respond to that is uh, always when you're bringing a new concept to the community, it's good to start uh, from a basis that is very relatable to the community. So for the specific community group that are working, grassroots human rights defenders, they're already working with uh, 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 on cases around human rights. Um, so how we connect the two is first um, identify what are the works that the work that they're doing and then um, see how that would manifest in the online space. So we look at the different mani manifestation of um, offline because uh, the violence is on a continuum. So an online violence can really end up offline and vice versa. So we try to have a thinking brainstorm session where the, 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 the participants are the ones telling us uh, what are the things that they're, they're, they're dealing with on ground and how they think it can manifest in the online space. And then from there, we then uh, talk about the types of online violence as uh, have been um, identified um, in different reports. Um, and then just see how they relate with that. Is, is it something that has happened? Because when you're starting this conversation, people are already experiencing online violence, but they didn't know it's online violence. So it's just also like, being very uh, intentional in realizing the nuances, even as uh, even as we have these discussions, and having like a space where it's not it's not like this room where I'm standing here. It's like more of um, a discussion. It's more of peer to peer exchange. We have a lot of group group work within uh, the, the the participants. So just to drill in the concept some more. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know if there's any question. We have two minutes left. Um, I think we can have our closing remark, unless there's a question. There are two questions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Rispa. Uh, I want you to ask if you can take any measures to encourage the participation of persons with disabilities in the community networks. So what can we do to encourage them to participate in these conversations? Um, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. So uh, yes, uh, people, persons with disability are also uh, part of the marginalized groups. And uh, for us, um, we, we have we, we have not had a, a participant who is a, who has PW, who is a person with disability, but I think um, more is to uh, also engage, even as we are inviting the leaders of these groups, because we work with organized groups, is to encourage them to bring a, everyone and anyone who um, can benefit in, in this kind, kind of conversation, and also maybe have very specific uh, trainings or conversation with the different um, grassroots human rights defenders so that it's the whole organization being trained um, in, in, their, in, their, in the place that they feel comfortable at. And even to make the content that we are, are training very um, sensitive with um, sensitive um, and, and also inclusive in its manner. But also like, uh, we, because of course these are things that we will experience definitely, we are very much happy to work with any organization that is already dealing with persons with disability so that we are not doing the, uh, we are not replicating efforts. So we can also invite experts who are already dealing with persons with disability. Uh, thank you. My name is Faisal. Uh, um, rather, my question is uh, uh, very basic, but uh, I would like you to shed some lights on uh, how do you classify some activity as an online violence? I would like to uh, know more about how do you classify some activity as an online, online violence? Sorry, how do we? I mean, how do you classify any activity and consider it as an online violence? Because uh, it depends from person to person to consider something as a violence. Uh, so, what is the what are the, I just want to know that uh, what are the standards that you are you are following and you are considering mm. that this is uh, an, an mm. online violence and this mm. is something not. Mm. Um, so, most of uh, in, uh, when we are having conversation around online violence, we always um, we always root it with human rights. Because ideally for, um, I think it's when you're violating someone else's human right, then becomes uh, online violence. And, and yeah, so human right is like our basis of our definitions of online violence. And also we understand the nuances around uh, online violence and freedom of speech. So also having a uh, conversation around when there's uh, freedom of speech um, become an online violence against a person. Uh, I don't know if Kath, Catherine, you have anything to add? Yeah, I was, I was going to say that there are some um, actions or acts that are already considered generally online violence. So like, for example, non-consensual image distribution or sextortion or blackmail or harassment in that sense. And so it would be ideally what would constitute harassment offline that would, okay. So it, it basically would then now be what constitutes harassment in that sense online, but mostly they would have to fit in this predetermined pre like definitions of what um, the, the types of violence that we would categorize in order for it for us to categorize them as violence. I don't know if I'm making more sense, but uh, what I what I seem to say is that there are predetermined definitions yeah. of um, several acts that constitute violence, and so it would be if that specific act then falls within any of those predetermined acts. 
Absolutely. And of course, there's uh, room for um, really drilling down to what online violence is. I don't know. I, I don't think there is one definition per se. But and this nuance, this violence keeps on ar ar um, arising. So for like APC, uh, who have been like part of our um, reference point, they identified 13 types of violence, and that is what we've been referencing. But as we see, even the um, cyber misuse act yeah um, really um, has details on the different uh, ways that um, violence can manifest uh, online but definitely there's room to really clarify and classify uh, the violence the online violence um, so I don't know if there's anything we are past our time I'd like to I really thank um, the participants in the room for listening in and for also engaging. Um, you can find us. We will share our details. Catherine uh, works for Article 19. Catherine Moya and myself is Rispa Aros from Tunapanda Net. If you want to uh, have these conversations further. But uh, overall, thank you, uh, offline participant. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Thank you, anyone who has joined in the online space. And uh, I hope uh, you will have a good rest of the day. Um, thank you. Thank you. Bye.